So one of the things I noticed, uh, like very big change that really stood out is the the investment in rural villages. Uh, I already mentioned that um, about the bike lanes, right? Because the yeah. the, 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 the villages, the, I think they're trying to promote ecotourism. And so they build these specially very nicely paved bike lanes down the countryside. You can cruise between the farms, the orchids, uh, between the fields and cross the rivers and canals through the villages. I mean, just very nice. And, and like all the houses along the route, they're all freshly painted. Um, yeah. Just like you remember when we went to that Thai socialist village? The new village, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like those beautiful murals depicting like the I idyllic uh, rural Thai village life. All, all Thai villages have those, yeah. They yeah. have the same type where you are. Uh, well, yeah, not not die village life, of course, but they have uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have uh, they have they just they have like just um some some of them painted with like uh you know a uh, uh, fruit trees or or like uh, a farm produce. I'm just like very beautiful, beautiful artistic murals that that just made like the, yeah, yeah. the 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 village seem much nicer, and and they even put. They even put like those bike stations everywhere because um, I forgot to mention. So in Hainan, they in China, bike share is a big. Well, it had at least had been a oh, big yeah. thing. Uh, in in Hainan, you used to be very popular, but now they have all been replaced by the Hainan city public bike, uh, bike rental. So you. If you are a local resident, or if you are not local resident, but like uh, you have uh, you're working in Hainan, you just bring your Chinese ID, your uh, work card, whatever. You go to the local, um, uh, you know, the biking, I guess, transport department. They can give you a issue you a bike card, and with that bike card, you can scan it. Uh, and it allows you to take a bike for up to an hour for free, um, no charge. If you return the bike to the bike station within an hour, and I have been taking full advantage of that by using my auntie's uh, bike card. <laughs> I've been cycling everywhere, and and like for me, oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, literally from the city center it takes me about forty five minutes. To an hour to get into the countryside, and and to the countryside with a nicely paved um, bike lanes and their and bike stations, so I don't have to worry about my hour hour limit is up because I can return my bike to the bike station and and rent and get another bike <laughs> for free for another hour, <laughs> so I can extend my yep. trip indefinitely as long as there are other adjacent bike stations and and, and uh, well you know go ahead sorry i just want to say um that that does have to do with ecotourism but it's also for the benefit of the local people as well because i do a lot of um driving around like rural areas just outside of mangsha and say you go off the main road and then there's like a um, there's a paved there's like a road for a little bit and then it turns to cobblestones and then it turns to dirt track <laughs> and then it turns to there's no more road you've end up at like you know some farm or the other like that oh yeah because you ride your electric scooters around right oh yeah yeah or, or i've got a bicycle now as well i've been trying to bike it a bit more as well you know lose a bit more weight that kind oh, of thing getting a little exercise nice more ex more exercise um and for for like workers who are going out to these farms or wherever on their bike or their scooter or on one of those mini flatbeds like a minute or two off the main road a lot of places it's like i feel i feel a little bit worried you know <laughs> driving up there on my scooter 
and it's not even the wet season yet. Well, like it is technically the wet season, but it, the, the rain hasn't really started in earnest. During the wet season, you know, you go a minute or two off the road and it would just turn into a, a quagmire, basically. It would be quite scary. And especially if you have to do that multiple times a day, go to work, go back from work, <clears throat> taking products to market, you know, it's, I, think, I think it's really necessary to expedite the, the flow of people and goods from these areas. Yeah, totally. Um, so that, that's part of it as well as ecotourism, which I think is an important consideration. Yeah, I think it's both. I think definitely it's both. Yeah, totally. Because cause right now, be, uh, before the ecotourism actually picks up, it's mostly still local people. You know, people from villages who use those bikes. And, oh yeah, and I think uh, I think still the the most convenient way to get around is still probably electric scooter. <laughs> and and uh, you know, I was surprised. Like my auntie, my uncles, you know, they're like 60, 70 years old, and you know, they basically get around using combination of the the public bike and and their own electric scooter and and it's just very convenient uh, affordable way for like working class people to get around yeah a lot of a lot of old people here still even use pedal carts to get around yes. <laughs> yeah like yes, i've seen that they take their goods and so on and so forth um you know to, to where they're going to sell on the back of a pedal cart or, or they're recycling um, and they just pedal everything around themselves and they go they go on the main roads and they're going like really slowly, but they're getting themselves around. They're not even using an electric scooter or an electric yeah. vehicle. They, they're using their own, um, their own legs pretty much, which. Yeah. And one nice thing about Hainin is that um, it just like some of the bigger city like Hangzhou or Yangzhou, they have, they separated out the motorized vehicle like cars with uh, with bike lanes. I mean, they call it non-motorized vehicle lanes, but you know, yeah. a lot of the electric scooter people still using it. I mean, right now because so many people using scooters, uh, that essentially became like a scooter lane. Um, but still, it's it's a lot safer than you know have these scooters weaving in and out <laughs> between cars yeah. And, yeah and and um in also another thing development i noticed in china since my return is um like people uh, I, I i don't remember uh in Chongqing or other places but definitely in places like hangzhou um and even in hiding people are actually waiting for the light signal now, like that, they, they actually <laughs> stop at the red light <laughs> and wait for the light to go green, rather than yeah. jaywalking or try to cross. I mean, there's there's still few, you know, people who break the rules, but I saw majority people wait for their turns, which is a big thing. I mean, people don't realize how big it is, but it is big for China. I I, yeah. I, I would not expect to see that ten years ago. People, people here still have no respect for zebra crossings. Like, if you assume that a zebra crossing is going to save your hide here, you're you're really taking your own life into your own hands. <laughs> but people, for the most part, yeah, do obey traffic signals. And um, yeah, you know, I, I have to say, um, like, you know, people right now there's a big. Uh, um, demonization campaign in the western media uh, about china being a surveillance state you know with security cameras <laughs> everywhere but um i i did notice there's security cameras everywhere but um uh, you know like its effect might not be what people think so uh just to give an example in in, in cities like hangzhou and shanghai they recently placed a ban on honking inside the city limits, right? And, you can't and the honk. way they what? <laughs> yeah, because it just creates so much uh, like noise level inside the city. Yeah. They just ban honking altogether. 
And the way they enforce it is through the security camera, through those surveillance cameras. Um, so those cameras apparently can both pick up, uh, both do visual recognition, uh, 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 pattern recognition, and you pick out sound. So, so the drivers who hunk and caught on camera, they will get a fine, right? They'll be fine. Uh, like they will get a ticket sent to them. <laughs> automatically yeah. and 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 so there's like significant uh, cut in in like unnecessary honking inside the city i mean there there's still people who do it um so my my dad asked about um ask about this uh, a driver say oh how come um the bus we took between two cities from like a neighboring city, Haiyan to Hainin. How come that bus driver was honking the whole time? Like, doesn't he get deduct points? Um, and our taxi driver's like, oh, that's because there, there was no security camera between that section of the road. So he can honk all he wants. <laughs> and he, he, wanted, he wanted to get his honk on, yeah. Yeah, and, and to, to, to demonstrate his point that the, our, our taxi driver you know honk as well he said see i can do it too because around here it's not covered by the security cameras <laughs> people's priorities are different um like the security camera surveillance camera everywhere that's like kind of a nightmare for a lot of people in the western societies but in china i really haven't uh, heard a lot of Chinese people express concerns about security cameras. Um, well, I mean, they, they have um, other then, issues to worry a, about. Go a ahead. lot of Western countries are a lot more ahead on surveillance than uh, China, even like, uh, you know, just like you know, even governmental involvement in surveillance. That you've got, you've got the Five Eyes Alliance, which like America. Uh, England, um, UK, Australia, and I forget the other countries are a part of. Mm -hmm. and this is well, the governments are spying on their own citizens without without warrants or anything like that. But also, there's information sharing. So, if you're a part of the Five Eyes Alliance, um, you can request uh, information about ex foreign national. Uh, so long as they're a citizen of a country that's part of the Five Eyes Alliance and their government will just give up their information to you, uh, foreign government, without without asking about it. Mm. So it's like, well, one, this this is a lot of what uh, a lot of the WikiLeaks stuff from years ago was about, was the extent to which the na Western nations uh, are spying on their own citizens. Um, in every conceivable way, uh, uh, there was a, there was an article in the West Australian, the, the the newspaper of my home city of Perth, and basically um, the headline was like, oh, the, the headline was like, oh, you know, um, oh, mass surveillance for Perth city. Oh, uh, the sub headline was Hua Chinese firm Huawei heavily heavily developing this technology, and it kind of leads you to believe that. The Chinese company Huawei are uh, involved in this mass surveillance project in Perth City, mm. but then you read the actual article, and it specifically says Huawei are not in any way, shape, or form involved in the mass surveillance project in in Perth City. But of course, most people, that was right down the bottom of the article, which was a relatively long article. Now, most people are going to see the picture, mm -hmm. see the headline, see the subheadline, and yep. go, oh, those fucking Chinese. Yep. Oh, they're, 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 blah, 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 blah. And that's, and that's the way the news was presented. Yeah. And I had to read through the whole article where it says in small print, oh, yeah, oh, by the way, Huawei aren't actually involved at all in this specific surveillance project in Perth City. It's just, but, oh, but they're, they're, they're heavily involved in development and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it was some British company, I think, who were doing it in Perth. Yeah. So I was like, even, even if the Chinese are not involved in that kind of project, like our journalists and like sub editors are still f trying to find a way to put Chinese fingerprints on yep. it. 
<laughs> which uh, which oh, I just don't, don't uh, most people just don't read articles anymore. They just read the headlines. And <laughs> that's what they do. read the headline, read the sub headline. Oh, those those dastardly <laughs> communist Chinese. Oh they're 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 spying on us. And it's like, well, it's a British company who are doing it. Yeah. Uh, and since 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 the United Kingdom is part of the Five Eyes Alliance. Who's doing it is England, Australia, America. You should worry about your data going to to the US or the UK. You shouldn't worry about your data going to China right. because China's not part of any kind of information sharing uh, spy alliance with any Western country, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of so the that, fear, the... <laughs> it's kind of overblown in 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 the west i mean like the like whatever chinese government policy its most immediate impact is the chinese citizen inside china like there's very i mean like a lot of the media is trying there's some people trying to shape the narrative uh in the media that somehow the, the oh, yeah. rise of china means the curtailing of personal freedom of of people in the West, I'm like, how do you get that? I mean, like, <laughs> this is this is re- that's ridiculous. Yeah. So, so at, at, at the same time as Western nations are taking more and more and more and more and more personal liberties away from their own yeah. citizens, mind you, they're doing more and more and more to blame it on China or blame it on Russia. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, why are you talking about Russia and China when it's your own governments and the alliances they're part of that are actually doing this? Yeah, that, sad but true. <laughs> but let, 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 let's get back yeah. to let's get back to talking about China because <laughs> yeah. on, on a more upbeat topic. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you noticed, um, uh, you know, because I know you left um you came to china in what 2012 uh you you stayed up for years end of 2011 yeah, you went yeah. back to australia you came back um and so you you've been you've been back and forth for 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 a bit uh I have, yeah. you know i for me it's a lot longer interval in between visit it's just for me like every time um like the big dramatic changes just stares me in the face. And and one of the things that I felt it was really different in 2019 versus my previous visit to China is that uh, back in 2001 and 2010, I feel like, you know, the, the, China, the change in China has been very impressive. Uh, China is a great place to visit. Um, but I would never consider like settling in, in China like for a long, long period of time, right? That's that's just well, you're thing. an Amer- you're an American citizen, yeah. Carl. You're an American citizen. Yeah, you know? that, that's that's just a tr- that's just uh, how I saw so- it back back then. In, like I'm like I just never consider China oh, as see. a place that's that's to to live, right? Like a livable place. Back, but yeah, 2019. I this time my impression is totally different. Like now, not only China is up and coming and changing fast, moving forward very rapidly, but it's the, the place is physically getting nicer. Like um, one of the things I noticed immediately uh, after I come to China, after I landed in Chongqing, my hometown is. The place got a lot cleaner because <laughs> I I remember yeah. uh, my memories of Chongqing right back in 1990 and back in 2001. Uh, you know the place was developing fast, but it's it's still kind of dirty and dusty. You know there's construction everywhere. Um, there's mud and and and, and dirt. Uh, but this time I went back to Chongqing. I was really impressed that that the streets are clean. And and that's because they hired this like team of these uh, old grandmas who clean the streets twenty four seven, right? <laughs> to keep it clean, and and they they do a very impressive job. And and 
And then very soon I realized that's not just Chongqing, right? Like I, I went to Mangsi. Um, yeah, I mean, Mangsi is like what? A no tier city. <laughs> it's not even, it doesn't even rank. <laughs> it's like one of the small unknown yeah. cities yeah, on the borderland of China. And it's relatively clean. I mean, it, 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 I'm, I was really impressed. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's there's two reasons for that. There's two reasons for that. One, as you say, more and more and more uh, labor power is going into the project of keeping the cities clean. And it's much more organized now that every street, if it's a big street, every section of street has its own cleaner. And their job is basically to sweep um, water plants, uh, get rid of rubbish, blah, blah, blah. And they have these little um, kind of like a buggy with like a big um, a big uh, bin on the back of it. And, they, and they, everything goes into there and then everything goes to the recycling facilities for further processing. So a lot. And, and that's good for the economy. It's good for the local environment. It's also good for the economy because um, I'm not going to say it's easy work, but it's like, here's a buggy, here's a broom, here's a dustpan, get to work. Um, so it doesn't require a great deal of training. Like, I'm not going to say it's easy work because you basically all day you go back and forth cleaning up. I know exactly what you mean because yeah. it, what you describe is playing out like in every city in China right now. And over at where I, I'm at in my dad's hometown in Hainin, Zhejiang, like I described before, Hainin started out as a small town and became a medium sized city. It's still expanding its parameter yeah. uh, very rapidly. And as it's expanding and swallowing up neighboring villages, uh, the way it's incorporating these uh, village population is that um, what I noticed, right? And also I asked my auntie um, <laughs> that a lot of the street cleaners are these old ladies from, uh, from these outlying villages, right? Previously, they mostly do physical farm work. But now as the city is expanding into their, their villages, the local government, they um, in return for their land, they built them these uh, kind of apartment complexes um, yeah, on the outside yeah, yeah. of the city, and and um, so so now by instead of doing farm work, they're hired on to clean the city, right? I mean, like it's still the same physical work, but but like uh, in in some ways less physical demanding than farm farm work and they it's also still meaningful employment for for these for these old ladies they're they're perf i mean they, they can either take uh like the government payout um now there there's some kind of like uh um government uh welfare for for the for the rural people but a lot of these old ladies they they're so used to do just perform physical labor all their lives. Yeah. They'd rather have something to do. You know, they, 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 yeah. they're very happy to take this job of being the cleaners and drive their buggies in the city to, to work. Well, so I, yeah, so yeah. right now China has this, it hit this like kind of the perfect um, balance, I guess, like the, the, in, in its development, you know, you had this, this uh, old ladies who are, who are keeping the place clean. I don't know how they're going to, continue on um, moving forward because I don't see like young oh, people doing that. Well, <laughs> like... um, I see there's plenty of middle-aged people who have picked it up here because it's like um, there's there's added revenue from recycling as well that like if you're um, like yeah it's, it's mainly older people like mainly Mao era people or earlier who are who are working as cleaners or unofficially working as recycling aunties, you know, like going through um, the rubbish and so on and like, you know, getting the recycling and taking it to the recycling centre and getting the money. Um, but there's there's more and more middle-aged people doing it as well. Um, it's, it's supplementary income. It's like for, for rural people, it's like you're part of the year you're doing seasonal labour. For part of the year... You're not doing seasonable seasonal labor, 
So you're either doing agriculture on your own piece of land or you have to find some other way to, to get money. And, well, yeah, I guess we'll see on that in the future, like what, what happens once the, the present generation um, is no longer around. Yeah. Where, where does that chunk of labor come from then? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, maybe but, robots. <laughs> maybe yeah. robots. <laughs> um, because I'm right, so right sure. now, so right sure. now, China hit that that perfect. It's like that perfect uh, place in development, right? It's like like this, as the city is expanding, incorporating villages, all these like village elders, they get recruited to do all these uh, uh, cleaning job to keep the city clean uh, and 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 function orderly. Uh, but but like these these kind like for the Chinese youngsters, uh, they have a lot easier lives than their folks and their parents. Yeah, and yeah. grandparents. Uh, I don't know if, you know, they, they, they probably aspire to do, you know, to, to do more. <laughs> so but we'll see. The, the thing about that there is that like, um, it's, it's that way. It's that what. Yeah, you know, I think I think the Chinese approach towards labor, like in Western countries, the historical development has been very much if we can use less labor, we'll use less labor. If we can come up with some technological solution for something that people already do perfectly well, we'll do that, you know. Um, as far as I can see, like <sighs> The Chinese way is much more, well, we'll just throw labor power at it. Like all of these jobs that people still do perfectly well, as well as better than machines, why would we go through the process of developing a technological solution when we can just use labor power and that and that averts the social problem that oh, people can't find jobs, people can't find work, what, what, what? That happens a lot, you know. You have a lot of structural unemployment in Western countries because of a lot of labor roles being replaced by uh, automation. And yeah, you know, like that is happening in China, but. Yeah, China I don't, is I, that has, that has... Uh, I mean, one of the things I notice in China also is. I don't know why. I just noticed prevalence of children everywhere. <laughs> I mean, oh, even yeah. though everybody talk about China as this grain population with a demographic bomb, but uh, on the streets, like visually, I see a lot of children, and a lot of times these children are being reared by their grandparents. Right? Grandparents. Yeah, usually yeah. The, the parents are working. So that's that's what I was going to say. So the, they have their own parents to come and, and help out. And some of the grandparents even, you know, either live very close by or they live with them, um, you know, to have some kind of like basically living nannies to take care of the kids. That's yeah. very common. Well, everyone, every, everyone looks after each other in the family. Like the family unit is still very important. Again, yeah. again, the, nu the nuclear family thing that happened in the West and people in the West now assume is the natural order of things, you know, because that's been the rule for the last two generations in the West. I'm not sure that ever really happened in China to the same extent, you know, that you've got mum, dad, uh, their kids, their house. And once you get a certain age, you, you set up nest by yourself, you know, the nuclear family. I'm not so sure that that happened to the same extent in yeah. China, you know? Yeah, it's it's different. So, it's almost kind of expected that once you have kids, your parents will help out. <laughs> I mean, that's at least well, what I see with all my cousins. Like all my cousins, yeah, yeah. Have their, 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 my auntie and uncles helping out with their kids. That's 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 what happens in the apartment as well. Like where I stay, where you were staying when you were here, um, you see all the old folks. Um, during the day, the streets belong to the old and the very young. Yes. Because the kids are at school, mm. the parents are at work. Yes. But if you're too young to go to school, you're being looked after primarily by your your grandparents yep. or or whichever elderly relative. Yeah, um, that, that makes sense because I, okay, so I, uh, I, 
you know, you, you would know this because you go exercise in that park where they have all these exercise machines and yeah, uh, th those exercise machines are actually, I realize they're everywhere in China because I'm not oh, yeah. among the East China, uh, in Hainin and also in the public parks here, they have those same style exercise machines. And that's that's socialized that's socialized healthcare bro prevention is better than cure you know <laughs> yeah yeah and 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 you see a lot of the old chinese people they're just out there in the parks doing exercise or they they, they do dance or they do tai chi together yeah, yeah. or martial arts i mean that, that's something yeah. you don't see in the west <laughs> oh yeah no the the extent to which old people are part of public life like old people here are like the the cornerstone of public life and are, are respected as such you know that people defer to elderly people and so on and so forth um but in the west it's like yeah if you're old you stay at home or you you stay in a nursing home yeah. or some something like that yeah but here nursing nursing homes here are like really objects of pity like nursing homes are for people who who one their, their family aren't around their family work on the other side of china like their entire family yeah. mind you or they live in an area where there's not like a guild of old people to hang out with during the day yeah. and play mahjong or chess and just generally hang out in public together like Oh, he's like in his 80s now um and he would just sign up for all these group tours i mean a lot of group tours i realize in chinese domestic tourism uh there are a lot of old people <laughs> like i went on a group tour oh yeah to a neighboring um the, the hendian film city which is a giant film set yeah, yeah. That, that they build like yeah, yeah, one yeah. to one scale replica of the forbidden city <laughs> and yeah and the group tour it's like it's like down. the cinema city in rome yeah Sorry. and and the forbidden city i went down uh, it's um it's mostly old people i was the youngest uh, youngest uh person there and and like my uncle right he he was he's like now 80 but he went on one of those group tours but he went all over china and like i was asking yeah. asking him about places um like he whether he has been to and so far like every place i named he'd been to i mean he he even been to like Urumqi in xinjiang right <laughs> he, oh wow okay. he'd been to dali and lijiang <laughs> he, he'd been he'd been to like Dongbei, manchuria he'd been to north korea and <laughs> he'd been to vietnam oh, wow. <laughs> i mean he got around like he's uh he's been retired for uh well over a decade now like there's another thing about china is that um recently there's uh, i think the, the the chinese labor law states that you know for the man you get to retire after 30 years working life and for women yeah. it's 25 years so you know yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter when you start like so my my uh, uncle who started when he was 16 <sighs> going to work in Yunnan on a Xishuangbanna <laughs> rubber plantation. <laughs> so his working age, <laughs> that starts at 16. And and he was able to retire, you know, like at 50. <laughs> and 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 like like my other uncles are, are, are very in very similar way. They you know they get pay uh you, they have pen, government paid pensions. They just travel around China. Yeah, they yeah, they yeah. go go hang out with their friends. I mean, uh, they have a good life. They they spoil their family from time to time. Yep. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Um, well, I see. I see a lot of that as well, and I I hear a lot of that from um, my family on the east of China as well. And like, yeah, they're all all um, retired. All the old folk, well, all the old folks. I say they're in their sixties, but either still work you know irregularly according to what they feel like yep. or do volunteer work or or look after the family so technically retired but still very active yep. or even even doing business for themselves yeah 
or helping with the businesses of their younger family, all this kind of thing. And this, it's like, you don't, you don't have to work yep. from that age, but pretty much everyone, even, even if they're not doing work, which generates an income, they're still doing volunteer work. Like, um, my my mother in law, she's she's well into her Chinese dance and Chinese theatre and all that kind of thing, and she she does a lot of performances at like um, old folks' homes and stuff like that, and and spends a lot of time practicing and doing that kind of thing in, in between looking after the kids and all yep. that kind of thing, because mo- most of most of my wife's family is still over there in Shandong, yeah. so. Yeah, and another thing I I noticed um, that I really like is that uh, I don't know if it's same in in Yunnan, but in over here in Hainan, um, Zhejiang, they have um, oh, and also Chongqing, they have these. Uh, so basically, if you are a senior citizen, um, if you are between age of sixty and seventy, it's a uh, half off using public transportation on, on public bus, trains, whatever. And if you're over age of seventy, you ride for free. You know, you ride free. Yeah, you- yeah. Um, I think I think there might be free. There might be free transport here. Public transport is so super cheap. Like, so say you know you get the bus in Dehong, it's never more than one or two RMB yeah. per trip. Yeah, and and, and it's so- the same thing actually over here and in Chongqing. I I think I must be like subsidized by government because. Um, I noticed a fair, there's yeah. a bus fare within the city, right? Not not a long distance bus, but yeah, yeah, within yeah. city, the bus yeah, the, fare is like two two RMB. It's it's the same in Kunming, yeah, yeah, in yeah, Chongqing, yeah. and also out here in East China in the Hainan and also Hangzhou. It's all just two RMB. You you take a bus, you can go. Well, that was. Go ahead. That was the thing in Tengchong where um, we got driven around, oh, yeah. which ended up being a good thing. Yeah. But it's like from from where we were outside the bus station, the bus to the um, the bus to the war cemetery. Oh yeah, it would have been two RMB. Yeah. <laughs> and that that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed for a long time. Yeah. But um, I. It was still the right decision to make because it saved a lot of time. Yeah. You know, like you wait for a bus, blah, blah, blah. We wouldn't have been able to go to um, the old Hershun. Right. If we'd we'd got the bus, I don't think. Um, But yeah, no, like it it costs like almost nothing. And it's like, yeah. Again, it's, it's like another, it's another difference here that the government has gone. There's no point privatizing this. It's a public service. Yep. It exists. The fact of its existing serves a social purpose, yep. which has all these kick-on effects elsewhere in the economy. It doesn't make any sense to have this service uh, running according to a, a, a purely profit motive. Yeah, yeah. and because and also parks. I have to point out public parks. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the same thing. People over seventy gets in for free. So like my dad is now over seventy. He gets in even though he's not even Chinese citizen anymore. He's he's still like he whip out his passport, show his birth date, he gets into all the parks for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And some and some of those places are a little expensive as well. That like if if you're paying um door price to go to Mangba Nashi here in Mangsha, it's what, like 50 RMB? Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, oh, for local residents, it's 40. So I only have to pay 40. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you get a season pass, it's like 100 for a year. So if you go there twice, you're already saving yep. money. And um, Oh, if you if you pay online, it's also cheaper. Yeah. So my so but yeah no like if, my overall point is um now in 2019 I just feel like China is a much nicer place <laughs> than I remember from 2010 oh, and and it's actually I, I did a much more livable place. I mean I could con- see myself living uh, here 
you know, settling down, living here for at for, some point for, yeah. for, for a few years. You know, like I, I did not feel that before, but now I, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a perfectly nice, livable place. I mean, the the air pollution can still be a problem in some parts of China, but there are there are parts of China where you know, like we're out out where you are, where air is clean, <laughs> and and yeah, and yeah. then life is good. Um, I, I feel I, that's, like that's that's why that's go ahead. Sorry, that's why I could live here in Mengshu, and that's why I feel lucky to have landed here in Mengshu. Because I, I am an asthmatic. I'm not that bad an asthmatic, but I am an asthmatic. Um, if the air wasn't good, say if I'd gone to the east of China first, first time in China, I, I talk about this a bit. I probably would have mm -hmm. left after six months, yeah. and I don't think I would have returned. Yeah. Like, if if I'd gone to say Shanghai, where the where you can walk through the air at times. Yeah. I don't. I don't think I would have returned, but because the natural environment here is very nice, and the development plan for here doesn't involve mass industrialization. Yep. And, and also, um, anything, anything. This is a second point I wanted to make about Chinese cities that they realize in a lot of places in China there is a problem. So they they do things like, well, we can't get rid of the industries altogether. So we have a two-part plan of either we can um, transition to making these industries less polluting, which they are doing in a lot of cases, like as far as the industrial po processes and power generation and all this kind of thing. Um, it's, all, it's all being transitioned to being less environmentally destructive. Or two, they move those industries away from yep. the city centres. Yep towards unpopulated yep. areas and then it's like so say there's a brick mill a big brick and concrete mill here in Mengshu and it used to be like pretty close to the city center I think I, I think I showed you it on the horizon but we didn't go out there um, but two years ago they've moved that brick and concrete mill like way outside of the city and so now um, there was there was beginning to be a problem with an uh, with like um, PM ten um, air pollution because of the brick and concrete mill, and they've moved it well outside of the city, and now it's okay. Yeah, th that um, it's yeah. You know, like basically I noticed the same process happening so in eastern China as well. The in city of Hainan, right? Again, it's a no tier city. <laughs> uh, it's not even been ranked, uh, but. The, it, the city government has already started the process of moving all the polluting industries out to further out to the countryside. Um, and they, they're the all new industrial park they're building. They're trying to get all the high tech uh, non polluting industries to come in. And at the same time, they're cleaning up all the rivers. Um, they're putting a lot of uh, yeah. investment into building up the public parks. Um, just, just, just in general, cleaning up the place. I mean, it's the, the place is a lot more livable. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot more nicer now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's and that's one thing. All of this creates employment, and this is one of the things that keeps China socially stable. Is if you if you need a job, you can find a job. It might not be like what you consider to be a really desirable job. But there's employment doing all kinds of things that in Western countries, those those jobs have been like, in, um, have been automated or whatever. And so you don't have those options for employment. Um, and this is one thing that so long as, so long as there's essentially a guarantee of labor, um, that's like a big thing that kind of maintains social stability that you've got, you've got like guaranteed labor, you've got um, the daily necessities, which are still price regulated. So um, I think even accommodation might Yeah, be. I mean, speaking of which, I mean, so cities are, are getting a lot nicer. And at the same time, uh, 
out here, it, it feels like, um, I, I think I lost my point somewhere. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We'll cut this part out. Well, well no, no. You, okay. Uh, well, you were saying uh, one, um, cities are getting nicer and two, but the way I the way I see the cities getting nicer and more livable is it's a two part process. That so one, um, but both both parts relate to um, labour. Um, that one, you know, it's much more dedicated labour going towards um, towards uh, keeping the place clean. Like all all the la- all all the recycling aunties and grandmas, all of the the public cleaners, all this kind of thing. It's all it's all labor. Speaking of which, that does remind me of and my, my point is coming back to me now. Finally, uh, so I went to that's, Hanye that's and good. Film City, <laughs> right? Where a lot of the Chinese yeah. period dramas and movies are made. Uh, what I what I notice is that they they have all these fantastic shows that stage in the in the inside the park. And, and I have been to Universal Studio, right, in, in, in Hollywood, and I've been to Disneyland. And yeah. they yeah. learn, obviously, they learn all the, all the special effects and the gadgets uh, from Hollywood. But at the same time, they were able to yeah. employ a whole lot more actors. So you, you have all these like the yeah. same special effects you will see get to see in Universal Studio Hollywood and you get to see in Disneyland, but you, you get a lot much grander scale with more participants. I mean it, like it's really epic. Yeah. When you do those period battle scenes, every soldier is an actor. It's not like fifty soldiers that are real people out the front. And then, like a sea of CGI, <laughs> but that's 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 kind of part- yeah. I, I'm not even talking about I'm not even talking about TV shows or uh, the movies they're filming. I'm talking about like those live shows they stage for the tourists. Oh, okay, sure, um, sure. Like, yeah, they got all these Hollywood style special effects. You know, all these technology that was brought in, but at the same time, they got. Ugh, a much bigger human scale because they just they can just have a lar- much larger um uh, yeah. uh, 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 larger cast yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> because totally. they can yeah well why why would and, and, they? and and I, I those shows were fantastic <laughs> what what kind of show is this that you're um, talking about oh, they have all sorts of shows i i i posted some on, on my twitter Okay, uh, you might, Instagram you and, might and, want to include some links to those, um, like when you put this up. Yeah, yeah, for so, sure. So people, because I did see some of your posts from the film city. Um, I believe, um, like they also they also do this kind of production in Tengchong, among other places in Yunnan, because especially Tengchong, um basically a Chinese uh, military commander and all of his men were exiled to the area of Tengchong in the 1600s. And they founded, this is, this is where like a lot of the Han element in Tengchong is from. Uh, and yes. a lot of, a lot of towns and stuff were, were founded. I think Hershun might, for example, might date from that time, but they, they do yes, a lot of, yes. They do a lot of filming stuff there as well because there's still a lot of period buildings there. Um, yes. There's the Ginkgo Village, which we didn't go to on our trip. Um, I've been there twice. Once I went there with my colleagues from the college when I was still working at the college. college. And the first time I was in Teng Chong, I, I actually appeared in a, in a Chinese period drama from the Qing Dynasty um, nice. Called the Secret of Jade, and my part was that I was a, a obviously foreign guy. I was dressed up in like a Joseph Joseph Mengele style outfit. I was the foreign chemist <laughs> demonstrating the quality of hydrochloric acid that it will dissolve nice. granite. It'll dissolve granite, but it won't dissolve jade. And so, if you've got a large uh-huh. amount of jade rocks to process. You can melt them down with hydrochloric acid. 
Uh, but oh, yeah, dude, no. you got to find the link to that video. Oh, man, man. I've, we'll, I've been we'll looking for such it. a long time. Like, <laughs> I, it, I think Do it, you know what they call in Chinese? <sighs> I was told the secret of Jade. It was on CCTV6. Okay. It would have been on CCTV6 okay. in 2013 or 2014. But it was oh man yeah um it was it was good fun um there was another foreign guy uh, a Welsh guy who appeared in it he was like a really tall pale guy and I'm like the tall like darker skinned westerner but the director because he kept he hadn't done any acting before he was quite good but he hadn't done any acting before and he couldn't control his facial reactions so he kept flushing. And every time the the producer would call, stop, 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 and he would say, you know, like, oh, your head, your head looks like a turtleneck again, which of course, <laughs> which of course is a Chinese analogy for a penis, because he kept flushing bright red, like his head kept flushing bright red, and so <laughs> they had to they had to keep on stopping filming and like oh. put more makeup on him, so. His 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 facial reactions wouldn't be so apparent on camera, but yeah, no, there was there was so many people like like the actors, like there was there was just like a crowd of like forty fifty actors who didn't do any actual acting. They were like props, basically. Yeah. That you're yeah. you're the background in this scene. You're dressing up as a farmer. You're in the background, like pretending to tend to these crops, or you're a soldier, or you're a lady in waiting, or you're a seamstress, or you're a student, or blah blah blah. And there was there was like the main cast, um, and then there was like this big group of like fifty actors who, depending on the scene, would just they would put on a different costume, put on different makeup. And then they would do whatever that scene called for. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Um, we so we what we what we need to do is <laughs> we need to regroup at some point and do a episode on the general history uh, and yeah. the introduction of Yunnan because I, I think because we've been talking before. about Yunnan uh, you know kind of as a. Uh, like a tangentially and, and and anecdotally, and I think we owe our audience to give it like a more comprehensive uh, the historical uh, view. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Context, context, context. Especially after I pick up that book of a brief history of De Hong. Um, yes. From from my stay in Mansu, now I gain a little bit more understanding of the local history in Yunnan. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it's a Yunnan is a fascinating, fascinating place. I wish you know more people just know about it. So, and I've I've been learning um, a bit more as well. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah. Um, that's perfect. But yeah, let's, no. Um, let's, did, uh, let's, do let's that leave it for the moment. Next time when we get together, we'll definitely do um do a comprehensive history of Yunnan. And uh, and its surroundings, and and it will be it will be fantastic. Um, yeah, man, and, I'm down. We, yeah, we have already been talking for almost two hours, so yeah. um, I think this is a good stopping point. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah, well, yeah. Because I've, I've got to start. I've got to start getting ready to go to work and stuff yeah, as well. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go to to do your uh, get back to do your day job. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, pretty let's, much. Uh, let's let's let, let's call it uh, uh, a stop right here. For the and, uh, I'll, okay. I'll do yeah. some editing afterwards. Well, let me just uh, say, uh, okay, thank thank you everyone for listening. Um, stay tuned for next time. Yeah, that'll be Silk soon. Steel podcast. Okay.